Okay, so hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our panel that combines two of the most critical acronyms of today's working fields. HR, human resources, and AI, artificial intelligence. We have a panel of masters of their craft, both from the AI, from the HR, and from the combination of them both. So without further ado, let's us welcome our panelists today, Yaki Dunit, CEO of Cocoa Hub Conversational Components, and the lead generation conversation designer of Cocoa Hub, Jason F. Gilbert. Say hi. We're not keeping social distance. We're, we're, yeah. we're breaking yeah. all the rules here. Uh, yeah. along with, uh, I'm not yeah. sure I'll survive this whole thing, so we'll see. Yeah. Along with Martin Redstone, recruitment chatbot consultant for PeopleBots. How are you, Martin? Hey, good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Great. And on the HR side, we got by alphabetical order, Dante Coladonato, employer branding and onboarding specialist in Clarion, a specialty chemicals company from Switzerland. Hey, Dante. Hi, Iran. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, do we got a Susanna on board? Susanna, I can't see Susanna for now, so uh, we'll wait her for, to join us. Um, Not I here? I didn't see her. Susanna, are you here with us? No, okay. Not yet. Okay. okay, so for now, Scott, we have Scott Gilbert, head of global talent acquisition at Andres and Hauser Group from Switzerland, a global leader in measurement, instrumentation, services, and solution for industrial process engineering. Hey, Scott, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Oh, we're fine, thanks. And Alice Parsons, voice tech and conversational AI recruiter for Tech Hire IO from the UK. What's up, Alice? Hey, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Aran Soroka, Head of Marketing Operations at the Cocoa Hub. Thanks for coming, everybody. And we'll start right with you, Yaki and Jason, uh, as you roll out today's agenda. First of all, Yaki, what is conversational AI, digital assistant, and what types of chatbots and digital assistants are ruling the, today's industry? Can we uh, share the screen first, maybe, with the slideshow? I don't need the slideshow. You are doing this. Well, they might want to see it. They don't want to look at us. They want to see nice pictures. You think so? Okay. Yeah. Good. I'm, okay, I thought that, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, here we go. You guys see the screen? Yeah. 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 HR and AI automating early recruitment stages, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. So, I'm gonna make it a bit smaller and then I'm gonna go to the next page. So, this is our basic agenda for today and we're gonna start with the introductions of the specialists and the recruitment people. And the first is Yaki is going to help us make sense of conversational AI because there's a lot of buzzwords out there. Put me on the screen, back on the screen. I want, I want them. You're on the screen. They no, see no, you. No, 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 no. Okay. Okay. Listen, guys. I'm not going to bore you with my long spiel about uh, conversational AI because this is an HR thing. So I'm very briefly going to touch on the on the borderline between these two areas let me just say or point out the difference between a digital assistant and conversational ai or a chatbot a digital assistant gets one input and gives one output it can be an action it can be an answer a song or whatever sometimes sometimes there is a follow up question but that's it Okay, there is no continuation, there is no context, there is no conversation. It's very efficient, it's very practical, but it's not a chatbot. It doesn't chat, it cannot engage in deep context, a, a multi turn conversation. A chatbot can do that. Until today, there's been enormous success in digital assistance, but there's not a single chatbot that can really, in the world, that can really hold a reasonable conversation for several minutes on uh, open domain. And the biggest companies have tried, you know, uh, I think uh, Microsoft only recently uh, released the last one. The open AI. The open AI, because they all do, but there is no real good uh, conversational AI on the market today. And the reason is there's no collaboration, there is no standard in the field, there is no agreed tool set or platform or standard. Everybody develops from scratch. We are here to enable collaboration and to enable a bot developed in one place or a part of a bot developed in one place to be used in another place. I won't bore you with the details, but that's what we do. We're the first place where you can exchange and use and reuse 
uh, conversational components. Now, the, I think before that, maybe we should clarify what a digital assistant and what a chatbot is. So That's what I just did, didn't you? You did. You did. You did. <laughs> But when we talk about the digital assistants, many of you know Siri, Alexa, Cortana. These are, you know, you talk to them, you ask them a question, they answer, and that's it. That's the end of the conversation. Chatbots are very limited in their domain most of the time, unless they're an open domain chatbot, like you said. And they're very usually task-oriented, which means, uh, so for instance, if we're talking about recruiting, then you would have a chatbot that is, that it's one purpose is to help you recruit or to do something. So that's the main difference. Uh, and sorry to interrupt you. No, okay. Go ahead. I'm going to do this a lot. Now, uh, many of you are recruiters and deal with HR. So you know that one of the fastest growing uh, professions or job definitions of today is conversational designer. If nobody uses the term today. Every other job offering is not provided. They can get three offers a day. So he shares them. By the way, he shares them on on the list on the Discord <laughs> for a job right there. And so and, and HR really lends itself to the use of chatbots. And we don't have it to any product market. But our first choice to team up with some specific vertical uh, and it really renders itself to the use of uh, chatbots and specifically voice chatbots and uh, I think today you, you'll learn that uh, it could really change your profession, your field. So I'll uh, let Jason carry on. And I think that's important for us today is to discuss it because we're, we're claiming that yes, chatbots can help you but we have some very uh, expert panelists here from the world of HR who are going to present us with uh, possible reasons why uh, the technology is limited right now and why it's maybe not perfect and ideal and how we can maybe get to a point where we can create the type of uh, conversational AI experiences that recruiters and, and talent scouts and HR people can confidently use in their organization. Uh, so back to the slide. Back to the slides. Okay. I think, uh, Iran, we're going to hand it over to Martin to talk I about it. No? Yeah, no, no. Before we were going with Martin to we'll talk about the current state of conversational AI technology as of today, June 2020. Martin, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, and what a fantastic introduction. Thanks, Yaki and Jason. Um, okay, so just to um, briefly introduce what I do. Um, so I've been a recruit in recruitment for the last 15 years. Uh, and for the last three years, I've been working specifically uh, within uh, chatbots and conversational AI specifically for recruiters. So I've got a good balance between being a recruitment practitioner and also helping recruiters with their conversational AI strategy uh, and journey. So, so where are we up to in the recruitment industry um, in regards to the current state of this technology? Well, for the last three years, there's been a lot of hype. Um, there's been quite a lot of people out there, a lot of vendors that have been really hyping up um, the use of chatbots within the recruitment process. But we're not there just yet as an industry. Uh, and the reason for that is because recruiters, by their very nature, and, and everybody here can, can give their opinion on this, we're very much conversational people. Um, we like having chats. We like having conversations with our candidates, with our job seekers, with our applicants. We like having conversations with our um, with our hiring managers as well. And so the, the feeling that you sometimes get from recruiters is that, um, is that uh, people won't like this. People won't like talking to a chatbot or talking to a voice bot. They don't like talking to people. My, my candidates won't like this at all. And, and so there's been a lot of pushback from people in the industry who need to use this technology um, to make their lives easier and to make the experiences better. Um, and, and so that's what we're up to right now. But what we're starting to see is some, um, um, to, to use a bit of a topical term, some green shoots coming out really in regards to the use of this. Now, whether or not the recent pandemic has been a catalyst for digital transformation, um, we can start looking at that. And we can say that actually, um, as recruiters, we were very much used to a candidate driven market um, before uh, the coronavirus hit, which means that there were there weren't enough candidates in the market 
for us to have a good selection from uh, because unemployment in, in a lot of countries was at an all time low. However, what we're seeing now, unfortunately, is that unemployment has skyrocketed in a lot of um, in a lot of economies, US, UK, Europe, um, uh, Asia as well, where unemployment has gone up. Um, so what you're going to be seeing now um, within the recruitment process is a much larger number of applicants. Now, on a good day, 65% um, of, of applications don't get responded to because most recruiters can't deal with that um, with, with that volume that's coming through. So if you if you times that by a hundred or even a thousand in terms of the number of candidates that you're going to be getting through uh, um, because of the unemployment rate, then there's no end of a poor experience that's going to be given to those job seekers who take it very, very personally that they don't get a response. So what we're seeing right now is a lot more interest happening um, within, within recruitment, within talent acquisition, in regards to how people can start utilizing conversation AI and chatbots within their recruitment processes, how they can start automating some of the more mundane, repetitive stuff, uh, which means that they can start giving a really good experience to candidates. So current state, to summarize, there hasn't been a great adoption for the last three years, um, but what we're starting to see is some green sheets in regards to an uptake in interest and an uptake in, in people looking to adopt this technology. All right, thanks uh, Martin for this one. And uh, we've got an interesting test case actually. So Jason will elaborate on this. Um, Dotty, the Domino's Pizza's recruitment automation bot. Jason, go ahead. Yeah, I think we're on the wrong slide here. There we go. Yeah. So, uh, hi. Can you guys hear me? Am I am I on mute? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, in 2019, Domino's Pizza rolled out a chatbot for the recruitment called Dotty. Sorry, called Dotty, and uh, I think it's a very clever name. And if you're making chatbots, you want to give them a clever name. Dotty is a great name. And if we're talking about a brand ambassador, then the the picture on the of the you know the Domino's worker Dotty and just the experience feels very light and very fun and if I want to apply to Domino's then this is a great way I can just go and go online and chat and get the initial the initial screening process through uh, the recruitment chatbot and they claim that uh, they were hiring they were able to hire uh, part-time workers or uh, hourly workers in the uh, a day to two, whereas before they used the chatbot, it would take them an average of five to six days to find candidates for certain jobs. Now, let's show, uh, Ken, can you show the video of the actual chat that we had with, uh, with Dottie, the recruitment bot from Domino's? Yeah, and can, can you guys hear me while this is playing? Yep. Okay, so, uh, is it playing? Is it, uh, okay, so Dottie takes, so as you can see, one of the main concerns, and a lot of people have uh, concerns about chatbots, is that they are not a, they don't really understand sometimes what the input the user is saying, and it's a very frustrating experience. Oh, like you can see here, uh, he asked, "Tell me about Domino's," and and the response was, "Thanks. Are you willing to work nights and weekends?" And then he said, "Obviously no, because who wants to work nights and weekends?" I, I mean, I do anyway, but. Um, they, you know, Domino says great. You know, Domino's. Are, you know, so th there's no real connection between what the user is saying and what the the the, uh, the bot is is replying to. And if you're trying to recruit at a higher level, then this would be a problem because it feels to the to the candidate like uh, this is not a great experience. Like this is uh, um, a very 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 bad experience. Okay, let's. Uh, Let's stop this video because I think we get the idea. And Ken, I want you to show the video. I uh, I customized the component. Uh, can I show that, or is we it? Have, no, just say we have. Uh, okay, I'm going to show you guys a video that I did with Anna, and then I'm going to show the next slide as the component. I'm going to show you a video of a different uh, approach to recruiting, which we used. Uh, <laughs> I don't hear anything. I'm done. I'm glad you stopped by. I'm here for the job interview. You are? Why? I want to work for you. So, person whose name I don't care to remember, I understand you want to work as my human assistant. Is that right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. You're going to need to cut that hair. 
first. We don't want hippies here, okay? I mean, okay. It's up to you, hippie. Do you feel comfortable answering a few questions first? Okay, sure. Okay, hippie. First question, if offered the position, when would you be available to begin? 2027. Next question, what are your expectations in terms of salary? Four billion dollars an hour in Russian rubles. Moving along, have you ever been in a Turkish prison? How do you know about that? It gets a yes or no question, hippie. Yes, I've been in a Turkish prison. Okay, well, I, didn't enough. I, I didn't expect it to go to the Turkish prison part. Yeah, so. Um, you can stop the video. man naked? Uh, some of you may... Re <laughs> the video. Too much information, Jason. Too much information. Cut the video. <laughs> so here you have two different two different uh, examples of uh, how you can engage a potential. I mean, obviously this is this is supposed to be a joke, and it's not supposed to be uh, a serious interview for uh, an employee. But it shows you the abilities that you can customize the experience, so it doesn't feel very dry when you're doing a recruitment you can tailor the the, the, the in this case we're going to call it a chat bot the recruitment chat bot to your organization's uh voice and style so if you're young a young and hip vibrant company you can create a young hip vibrant chat bot that will ask questions that will be more in line with uh the, the target audience so the next slide i'm going to show is actually the component that we have on the marketplace, and that's going to be the last one that I'm going to show because slides are boring. Uh, let's go to the next one. Okay, so, and I know that uh, the HR people in here are going to have things to say about every single one of these points, and that's why it's very important for me to show what we think in terms of uh, current state of technology, the benefits of having a chatbot do early stage screening. First of all, it's available 24-7, which is something that uh, if you go to some, you know, you have to wait a day or two days or three days. With this thing, it's available all the time. Reduces the workload. You can answer specific, uh, like Martin was saying earlier, you can automate specific uh, tasks, certain answers, and you can even schedule an interview directly from the bot, which will help you uh, basically through that early stage of recruitment. So those are what we see as the main points of uh, the main benefits, uh, sorry, of automation. And now that we've kind of given you an overview of, of the conversational AI and the, and the chat bot, uh, let's hand it over really around to the HR people so they can give us more perspective on you know, what, what they see as the issues and the pain points that they're having and why they may or may not choose to go uh, or use automation. Yeah, thanks, Jason. So the HR expert will elaborate on things like current hiring best practices, benefits of implementation, automation, pain points, and what's the best approach for my organization. And we'll start with Scott. Um, which one to choose? There are many companies that offer solutions, though. Which is right is right for your company, and what criteria should I use for the selection? And also, there's a subject of cost versus benefit. So can you talk on that? Absolutely. Um, I think that I saw a statistic about a year ago, that they were not just for chatbots, but in general for AI and different tech for recruitment, there were about 1,600 different companies providing different kinds of solutions in different areas. So if you're going into this cold without a lot of tech knowledge, where to even begin? Uh, and then once you introduce some kind of tech to the company, how do you convince people that maybe aren't so technologically savvy about the cost of some of this, this tech as well? And some of it's pretty expensive. You know, some of it's reasonably priced, some stuff's very expensive, so those two factors come in there. And then you go into the element about the, uh, the volume recruitment. You talked about Domino's Pizza. So you have different levels of recruitment, different stages. So if it's high volume, maybe how do you deal with it there? Or if you have more niche recruitment, if you're dealing with different generations, so more a professional level, or you're dealing more with students. So I think the different texts speak to different people. And some people like to engage with them. Other people don't. And so I think you, you might turn some people off and, and so the different elements, plus there's the, the element of compliance. And if you're talking to a chatbot, and in certain countries, if the chatbot 
understand something the wrong way, it could give an answer to somebody, which later on you could be sued for. So I think there's also the element there of how do you keep the lawyers off your back? So there, there are a few different angles to look at this. Um, on the personal level, I think it's a great leap forward, but how do we then make sure this stays in the right place and is used the right way? Okay, Scott. So um, Dante, you wanted, um, sorry, I'll try to talk uh, slower. Dante, you emphasized the subject, for example, of tech resistance in the decision-making position. Can we maybe, first of all, the audience, we have a chat window here. If you have any questions, just type in the questions so people can, can answer along the way or ask along the way. It's on the bottom right. Um, but maybe we can address some of these issues or do you want to go on and present some of the pain points because he brought up some really good points and uh, not just because he's my brother, just, you know, uh, he did bring up some good points. Okay. So uh, if anyone, Martin or Alice, do you have, uh, or Yaki, I, cause I, I can answer one of one part of the question. There are a lot of, like Yaki was saying earlier, it's a very, very fragmented market. Mm -hmm. And you as a, uh, in HR, you have a choice. You can either build it in house which means you have to build a team and have a development team and integration and all that, or you can outsource pick, pick, it. Pick one of the 1600. Pick one of the 1600. So <laughs> it really comes down to a tough choice for HR. And a lot of times that's a choice that they don't really, since they, you don't have that knowledge, you don't have that expertise, you don't even know really where to begin. Mm. So it's an issue and it's something that uh, hopefully the tools that are provided for the average or layman can become easy enough so that anybody can implement them uh, in their in their in their flow in their chat in their for their organization. And sorry for interrupting, Aaron. Go ahead. Yeah. So I wanted to ask uh, Dante because Dante brought up, for example, the subject of tech resistance in the decision making position. Um, we already tried to uh, you know attack it from our side. How do we see it uh, on the HR side? Um, sure. Thanks, Henry. Um, basically, I think also um, what Jason just mentioned about how do you pick the right tool, how you feel equipped to pick the right tool. Um, on the other hand, what, what figures do matter in this case? Because an, an HR or recruitment professional would look at some figures, some advantages in terms of time saved and, and volumes and what have you. I think Martin brought a couple of interesting points there. But I guess um, it needs to be elaborated for those type of companies, not always as, um, let's say, quick and, and I want to say kind of students oriented or different type of jobs where the decisions is, is taken at a more senior level. How, how do you sell it, actually? How do I potentially sell it to people that don't, uh, don't really immediately get it or change companies after a while? So how, how does that work? Yeah, there are several additional points. I think Jason will elaborate. Yeah. A bit more. Um, okay. There will be something about, you know, how, how communication changes, how colorful languages could be, or coming back to what my, my background or my tasks here at Clarion are, how to reflect that type of brand. And Jason touched upon that some time ago. It would be interesting to understand how do you tweak that tone of voice from a company and that, how to make it really fitting your company culture, company um, um, lingo even. So there's a yeah, and how, and how do these solutions interact with the company's existing tech ecosystem, for example? Exactly. Some yeah. companies uh, have trouble recruiting, especially when looking for high-level employees. And, uh, and you, want, you want to get the good ones, and you want to persuade them in the early stages, if they're looking for the job, the good ones, that you're a company, uh, worth working for so you want to basically when you have a recruitment uh, bot you can you can uh, uh, design it according to your corporate values okay if you're selling nike uh, or you're selling some uh, a, a young uh, garment in the garment industry clothing or something you will have a different type of uh, of bot trying to recruit people than a TV station or any other kind of business. You, you have the potential of selling the position that you are recruiting for by using the chatbot with the right style, the right wording, the right type of speech to attract the ones that you want. So the approach is already carrying some of the selling points that the employer looking for the candidates 
uh, is willing to show and display and use the process of the recruiting. Yeah. So you could have a very, uh, you, and Jason can give some examples of, uh, of uh, bots with personalities that very well represent the spirit of the organizations that they represent. Uh, Alice, uh, you're familiar with the issue of volume recruitment versus niche hires because chatbots and AI have shown benefit for higher volume hiring, especially for large players like Amazon or retail banks. However, how can they benefit the niche positions that most companies struggle to fill? Yeah, so I guess like from uh, my personal perspective, so um, like uh, at TechHire, we're an, uh, an agency, so we're not an in-house uh, HR recruiter. Um, so I guess I'm coming from it from a slightly different angle, but still very relevant. Um, but uh, I, could, I specifically focus on voice tech and conversational AI. Now, this is still a very sort of niche and uh, emerging industry. So when it comes to hiring, it can be difficult to find people with, uh, especially if they require very specific skill sets. Um, so the recruitment process is, is slightly different. So it's, uh, it tends to be a lot more of us actually approaching um, potential candidates. And a lot of those are um, passive candidates. So they're not actively uh, hire, uh, they're not actively looking for a role. So um, from our part, there becomes a challenge, obviously trying to approach them and, and almost get them on the hook straight away for a new opportunity. Um, so it's a lot more of us approaching them than them approaching us and applying and having that high volume. The volume tends to be a lot lower um, and a lot of uh, work on our part to try and essentially find these people. Um, obviously, that comes with... Uh, having for them to be sort of findable and searchable so having sort of keywords on their cv or uh, linkedin so it, it comes up on job boards and we're able to find them essentially um so i'm interested to see obviously that's a challenge for us so how that would work with ai um and how ai could potentially work in a niche uh, industry like this where um, you know, you don't potentially have those high volumes. I personally see AI, um, as we touched on already, being very uh, valuable so far in terms of like the high volume stuff. So being able to uh, sift through uh, CVs, which can take a very long time. Um, they tend to be maybe more on the junior type roles or, um, you know, just sort of quite... Um, you know where you would tend to get high volume but when you start going niche um you know that volume really drops so yeah that's sort of my perspective i'm interested to see thoughts on that and dante you also continuing what alice just said you also talked about failing to consider the applicant as a precious customer it's like a change of uh, um, of you know attitude for, for from the hr to the customers to the applicants uh, exactly, I think um, all of this comes to to get a, a more of a dialogue and and proximity instead of filling forms. You can talk to someone. At the end, it's it's about that dialogue. I agree with the differences of, of when you have to talk in one to one because you have basically three candidates for a, a very niche position. But at the end of the day, providing an experience that is not filling forty different panels on your whatever uh, workday success factors and, and, and whatnot. I think it's already considering uh, that additional step that you do as a company to get closer to, to a candidate and treat him as a, as a customer, potentially wanting to return and potentially wanting to retain. Mm -hmm. uh, also yeah, problems. Things, oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Aaron, I was going to say, I think there's been some really interesting points being made actually by everybody here is that um, there's no one standard scenario that um, that companies or, or recruiters um, see that can be impacted by the use of AI or, or conversational AI. Um, uh, to, to take Scott's point forward, actually, the, the world of HR technology is just huge. There's like 46,000 HR technology companies globally with a uh, VCs investing still um, just over a billion dollars a quarter um, in the in, into the industry. So it's a huge industry where the vast majority of those newer companies coming out have something to do with AI um, within either their title or their um, or, or or their their technology. So 
so to take the points that everybody is making, um, there, there's no one standard scenario. And, and to dial back a bit on the vendor selection piece as well, the one thing that I have found and, and will always suggest is that vendors usually have a specific pain point nowadays that they target um, from a value prop um, perspective. So if your um, if your your pain point is hiring high volumes of hourly workers, such as Domino's, then there's a vendor out there that specifically has a conversational AI solution for high volume hourly workers. Um, if it's about um, you know high value um, candidates who are you know higher paid professionals, so it's less volume, more relationship. Then sometimes it's almost about delivering FAQ management via chatbot because they want to know a little bit more about the company culture or you know, if and when we get back to offices, is there a ping pong table there? Can I bring my dog in? You know, those kind of questions that again bogs a recruiter down in um, in in time sapping mundane conversations. So it's about mapping out the pain points in that converse, in that in that recruitment process from a conversation perspective. Um, to take Dante's point, you know, his job is employer branding and, and actually any good um, chatbot vendor or, or like you said, build it yourself, anybody that's building a chatbot for you has to work very, very closely with the employer branding team if there is one. If not, then marketing or recruiters because it's all about getting your brand into the bot. You know, it's something I've, I've just in the middle of a project myself and it's huge part of the project for for this client's perspective is making sure that their brand is in that box everything from tonality and language all the way through to the colors the fonts etc etc so um hugely important as well so i think there's quite a few bits that are coming out of here that are really interesting um but for me the main message so far is that there's no one size fits all solution to the challenges in recruitment and i see a, a plethora an absolute plethora of case studies and, uh, and scenarios and use cases that people can use and do use um chatbots and conversational ai in really really interesting and I think an, uh, another point that we haven't really talked about, Scott, is the G GDPR or what's going on in mm -hmm. California right yeah. now. Yeah. Because we are, uh, you know, basically asking people to provide uh, personal information to the chatbot, then not knowing that other people are reading and then... Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously the easiest way around that is to get them to, uh, in the beginning of a conversation, and you see this a lot with but is by continuing this conversation, you are agreeing to the GDPR rules and da 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 da, and it's a long thing. And then you click yes, and you continue <laughs> on the job. You need to work at Domino's. Um, but uh, the idea here is that it can be kept. And one of the things that we do here at Coco is we basically the conversations are anonymous, so we don't know. We pass it along to the HR or the recruiter and they really give them bits and pieces of information, not enough for them to be able to put together a full picture, uh, a profile of this person. We don't give them the name. Uh, in this case, they we give them parameters. So yeah, we would give them the name, but that we wouldn't be able to tell who that person was or we wouldn't retain that information that's not stored anywhere. So with issues of privacy, it's a huge issue and I think it's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, but I think a lot of companies are beginning to understand the ramifications of not being GDPR compliant. Uh, and even in the U.S. and California now, they're getting a bit stricter about it, too. So uh, that's something. And um, Dante, I wanted to ask you about the tech resistance, because I'm not really sure I understood what that, what that means. So, uh, uh, people are still tech resistant in our day and age? Have you ever worked in a specialty chemical company? <laughs> <laughs> it's a problem of chemistry, someone, I guess. <laughs> someone did. Uh, I mean, on one hand, there is there is the compliance piece, of course. I mean, that, that, that's serious stuff. Um, um, that type of data that you share is also where is it actually or physically stored um, or that type of thing of you say, so like read and accept all type of, of message that in, somehow you still need. You're treating personal information, you're treating sensitive data sometimes. Um, on the other hand, the resistance. I think it's it's natural when um, the mindset is things have been done in a certain way for decades. Why why should you change it? Why should you change the status quo? 
can be in whatever field. And I think in 10 years, 20, whatever years from now, conversational AI would be the standard. And then you're like, why would you challenge that? Because you're comfortable, because it's, it's easier to think that you need a bigger team to do the same amount of stuff you do right now. Uh, there could be several reasons, even do not. Applications. What's that again? How many faxes a day would you say you get applications in, in a fax form? Fax or even uh, fax people or, do still require. Letters? How many letters do you get a day, would you say, when you go to the post office? How many letters do you pick up a day? Maybe, maybe pigeons are also flying in. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard for me to believe that in this day and age, people are still clinging to these old techniques of faxing and, and you know, and like, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not understanding, but I'm, I'm curious because this is, this is very new to me. So I'm, I'm happy that you're explaining it to me. Well, we received letters. Just, uh, oh, go ahead, Dante. Sorry, man. Uh, just, just quick. We received letters, and we're like, uh, you know, creating a process behind the scenes to now deal with the letters that we receive with these beautiful C paper CVs that we still receive. Um, we need to create a GDPR compliant process at the in, in the background. So it, it still happens. You'd be surprised how many times it still happens. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, and and uh, are, they, are they still using the foldable things, Dante, with the, the nice laminated? Yeah, it's crazy. No, but what, what you see when you talk about tech resistance, it's it's also at different levels of the organization. So if you talk about large conglomerates, you have certain uh, parts of the organization, especially the senior management, that didn't grow up with this tech, and so for them, it's 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 really new, and also it requires a lot of investment. And so if you're trying to convince people to to change the way they operate. Uh, with the GDPR in the background, it's difficult a lot of times because you're speaking to people that maybe are not understanding the bigger picture of, as you mentioned, it's not pigeons and, and mail anymore, but it's a completely different world out there. And I think for a lot of people, that's very easy to understand. But if you go to a certain generation and ask them for, you know, triple zero type of budgets for this stuff, it's going to be difficult to get because they don't understand the, the pure technology part of it. And I think that's also some of the resistance here you're finding in the organizations. Alice, do you see like a difference between um, people in, in different verticals of being tech resistant or like getting all out on the conversational AI? Yeah, well, this is one thing I was going to touch on, actually, because I'm really interested to see or hear from, hear from uh, you guys what you or if you've seen like adoption from candidates. And I don't know, Martin, you might have a better idea of this, like from from your clients and stuff like how have um, candidates like taken to this? Do they like it? Do they not like? Uh, and if they do, does it depend on um, you know the the type of role, um, or is it you know is there a sort of a split at the moment, or is it pretty? Does it vary quite a lot? Like that's one thing that I'm really intrigued in finding out. Um, like for us personally, we don't actually use, even though we hire within conversational AI. I'm very much all about AI. Um, we've not found something that really uh, fits into what we're doing at the moment. I think certain models definitely does, um, but others, uh, the, the majority of what, what the type of roles that we cover, um, it's hard to see where it would fit in um, in certain areas. So yeah, I guess like candidate adoption is one thing I'm really intrigued about, and I don't know if you've got any uh, info on, on that. Martin, how you do you uh, convince people to like take the little step between uh, being like tech resistant and uh, coming to the new world? Yeah, good question. Um, so I, 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 for me, it's all about putting together a strong business case um, for, for the simple fact that um, any business leader worth their salt, as long as you can demonstrate a, a significant ROI, and I'm not talking about, you know, 1x, 10x, I'm talking about, you know, 40, 50, 100, 200, 400x ROI. Um, so, so as long as you could demonstrate that, and that could be, um, and, and we talk about, you know, certain metrics within recruitment that Dante, Scott, Alice, you'll get, you know, things like empty chair time, time to hire, all those kind of things that, that impact on, on an organization's performance from a talent acquisition perspective. As long as you can show that return on investment, um, then most organizations that I work with are willing to take the leap. Um, 
it might not be a big leap. It may be a um, it may be a, a proof of concept for three six months. It may be a, just a yeah. Do you know this is big on our agenda? Let's just go for it type situation. As long as you can prove that ROI and track that through the the course of the project, then um, I find most people understand that from a business sense. Uh, we, um, have, we have yeah we have a question for questions from uh, first of all from Milan McGraw. Uh, he says that uh, our budgets are maybe six. Uh, uh, maybe Milan, do you want to tell, to to join the conversation and ask? I mean, I can summarize it for him. Okay. If Milan, unless you want to do it. Okay. Basically, he's saying that the the, the you know their budgets are six to twelve months ahead, and so for them to make a change and to shift to adopt a new tech or a new company. It's something, it's not an easy process and it will take a company a long time, especially if they have already invested in some kind of AI or some kind of uh, uh, a solution. And so that's a really good uh, question. And I think that part of what we do here at Cocoa Hub is we work with existing uh, ecosystems. So if your company has already made an investment and already has allocated a budget to a certain provider or a certain chatbot builder or studio, then there are other companies that can come and basically augment it like us and improve that using the existing tools that you've already invested in. So it's not like you have to start over again or reinvest in the in a new in an all new ecosystem of chatbots and AI. You would just use uh, tools that are that are free on the market or available on the market to augment uh, your chatbot or your existing ecosystem. Did you want to yeah. add anything? Well, it wasn't really a question, it was more a statement that uh, Milan made. Mm -hmm. and, and I, <laughs> also, just uh, bear in mind one other, one other element. I think it's, it's important to note that if, if you're working across different geographies, you're also going to have a, a different adaptation to different technologies in different parts of the world. So, I mean, in, in a, my previous company, when, when Dot and I were working together, we had uh, rolled out a certain technology uh, that was regarding uh, video interviewing, as an example. And it was adopted very highly in certain countries, and they loved it, and they wanted to use it more and more. Other regions and countries wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. They said, our candidates will not want to use this. If we start rolling out video technology and interviewing, then it's, it's done. Forget it. We're not going to get any candidates. So I think you also have to bear in mind when, you, when you're going across different geographies, or if you're using a global system or global budgets, that you're going to have to adapt it to different markets as well. And some of them will be your adapters, and some will be later. So just something to bear in mind. When looking at this tech again it's that's why it's so important to be platform agnostic and to be able to port things that were done in one territory to another otherwise you have to reinvent the wheel every time mm -hmm. yep. now to, to stefania's question well, stefania's question was actually a, a private question but i think it's relevant for the group she sent it to me privately but i think uh -huh. stefania it's a good question and it goes really to the heart of some of the issues that were brought up here today. If someone could give us uh, some engine. That well, she isn't, they don't know what the question was. Stefan, uh, uh -huh. Stefania asked, what about, uh, what about the emphatic, em the empathetic, I'm assuming that empathetic capabilities for chatbot and conversational AI? And it goes again to what Dante was saying that maybe uh, people don't want to really inter you know, talk to a chatbot. It feels impersonal to them. And I think that empathy is is, is huge and if you as a chatbot designer conversation designer chatbot developer can create an experience a flow that is empathetic to the user understands and doesn't feel like the domino's daddy that's ignoring the user hello darling hello darling yeah Anna, that's my anna if you can basically figure out a way to show empathy and i know stefania ha ha is working uh if I'm not mistaken, at emo shape where they do uh, emotional analysis. Stefania means the other way around. You're talking about the empathy that is displayed by the bot. Yeah. Stephanie, Stefania is talking about the bot recognizing the emotions of the person. Am I right, Stefania? Only one person can answer that question, and that's Stefania. So can it's you unmute her? <clears throat> Stefania says it's especially uh, for the healthcare, maybe I'm just to help her with the audio. Uh, her audio is not working, especially yeah. for oh, sorry. healthcare. Uh, yeah, because listen, if you're hiring for healthcare, if you're hiring for a hospital, there's a high volume, but you actually need to have empathetic abilities if you're dealing with, I guess, recruits. I think, I think, I don't know much about Stefania's, uh, about Emoshape, but I think what they have is some engine that's supposed to analyze the emotional state of the person that the bot is speaking with. 
and react to it. So besides the, in, the regular input channel of the text or the words that the user is saying, there's also sign language, there's also body language, there's also tone of voice and stuff that can be measured and on the second channel, parallel channel, feed the bot with information to choose its words accordingly. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I just touch on that as well? Um, I think like as well, obviously, given the current situation, it would be interesting to see like how many companies actually uh, continue with like remote working, which obviously um, if that does happen and that is the case, then uh, it opens up a huge uh, opportunity of candidates uh, from potentially different countries and um, depending on the, the needs of, of the company or the client. Um, so I guess like touching on what Scott said about um, as well, I know it from a bit of a different angle, but how would a chatbot be able to um, like recognize different like cultural understandings? I know obviously with uh, the whole NLP side of things, like this is really a, a key thing, especially when it's trying to be very human-like and empathetic and stuff like that. Obviously, if you're if you're hiring in a, a fully remote role and and the company or client's pretty open to any country, for example, uh, we're talking like a so many different cultures and, and different ways people perceive things. So um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, Martin, do you have something to say to Alice that's about this? A great question, Alice. That's a great point, Alice. And it's something that uh, it has to be, I think, customized to each market. I think we've seen that with some of the customers that we have that have multiple uh, regions and have multiple, you know, that it can't be the same, uh, you know, the same chat by the same personality for each market. And if some markets, you know, need to react differently, then maybe the personality of the bot needs to be adjusted. And I've seen that in larger corporations, like uh, uh, we were at a, a Vodafone hackathon in February, and for each one of their markets, uh, they have a main chatbot named Toby, and he's their chatbot for their main UK site. But in India, it looks different. It's named differently, and it's, it acts differently, and it functions differently. So each market basically determines what would work for their uh, uh, audience, demographic. And the, uh, the, the, the trick is to be able to give them the tools to create those experiences very, very quickly based on templates that were used in other countries, but just changing maybe the language and changing some of the text to make it uh, more localized and more appropriate to the culture. Uh, I, I hope that is anywhere near to answering your question. Very good. Alex. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, Dante, you also uh, work for a huge company and you talked about local differences, peculiarities. Uh, even in Switzerland, there are like three different languages. How do you deal with uh, that? Um, I'd say coming back to Jason's point, you have to develop markets or let's say solutions for different markets with, with a talent acquisition team that is active in different regions or down to a country level. At the same, I, I would apply the same type of structure to something that needs to be adapted locally. The only point, or I would see that as a challenge when you see, for instance, um, differences according to regulations, differences according to standard practices when it comes to recruiting, or some questions that you can or cannot ask for whatever privacy, uh, security type of reasons and whatever. So it has to be fine-tuned as much as you can to a very local level, also when it comes to language, not just the one that you have as an output, but of course understand the input. We may have all, all people on this call I don't know, 35 different type of accents, um, reading things in a different context and contextuality. So it's going to be interesting the amount of information that you can take in as, as uh, to, let's say, give back a sort of output that is that can apply and it's liable and it is, you know, um, respectful successful in all of the and scalable as well in all of these different markets you need to play on yeah I think from a I'm mm -hmm. just gonna say from a, from a recruitment perspective if you think about the standard candidate journey of application uh, and filling out a form on an ATS such as you know, Taleo or Workday or anything like that um, you know over here in the UK, if I if I applied for a, a, a UK-based role for a US company, 
I'd get asked things about being a, a, a veteran under US law, which is just totally and utterly irrelevant for me. So being able to localize creates a better experience. So I don't want to spend an extra five minutes filling out, um, filling out information that's just not relevant to me or my location. So being able to localize that's really important from an experience perspective as well. Um, and, and, and I totally agree. I think that's the best way forward. Yeah, Milan McGraw, our friend, uh, said that they operate in 15 countries, so localized by country or market, the best to capture right content and sentient of the conversation. So, Jason, we can just start by offering a solution to one market, maybe the biggest market, and then ask them for help with uh, translating it to other markets. Yeah, I think that's a good approach because I think the local markets understand their, like Scott was saying, they understand the needs and they understand the needs of the people and they know how to approach them. And if you can design an experience or a flow or a personality of a chatbot that would appeal to them and be able to uh, reach them in their language, uh, not just literally the, their language, but the way they speak, uh, then I think you have a good chance of, of recruiting really good people. And I, I I disagree with the with the fact that it you know it's just large scale like just you know you can do this I think that you can customize an experience to be uh, you know you can drill down deep, deep enough to really get an automated chat experience with a very qualified candidate and get him to or her to answer questions uh, you know so to me it feels like we're almost there and maybe uh, the experiences that a lot of people have experienced here have been negative because a lot of chatbots out there are not not a great examples of what the, the technology is capable of, but I think that uh, these issues are actually solvable and I think that we're pretty close, not us, I mean, but in general, the technology is pretty close to getting to a point where we can create very customized experiences for very uh, localized uh, markets. Uh, yeah, Martin, uh, I wanted to ask you, how modifiable is a bot or approach? What are the limitations currently? Because we are like throwing all these uh, opportunities, but there are some things that still are, cannot be done by bots. Yeah, um, obviously, um, yeah, a lot of the stuff that we talk about is um, uh, almost theoretical. I mean, there's a lot that's, that's very um, realistic, but if we start talking about you know, large scale rollouts across multinational corporations in different uh, personas for different countries, it can be done and it can be done by a huge organization like Vodafone, but most organizations probably wouldn't invest that amount in a purely uh, one dimensional bot, one dimensional from a use case perspective, which is talent acquisition. So I think. And I, I totally agree with um, Jason's um, point, which is, uh, and your point as well, Aram, which is um, start with one location, start with one use case and one scenario, prove um, the use case, prove the value. And to Alice's point earlier, prove the candidate experience as well. Um, and then you'll, you'll get better buy-in for much larger rollout. Um, in terms of scenarios that we're seeing right now, um, one of the things that we haven't spoken about is all the different use cases and scenarios. But when we talk about GDPR, when we talk about um, um, senior um, candidates as well, one of the biggest use cases that, that we see quite a lot of is outbound um, automated messaging and chat. So keeping in touch with candidates that are on your database uh, via automated messaging that takes somebody from there into a chat. Very similar to Dotty, but not as... Um, poor from an experience perspective I'm <laughs> yeah um but but if you think about the dotty example you know somebody's had to request that somebody's had to text in to a short code and then they get a chat back now what if you're able to text that person and say hey do you want to um talk to us about our current roles or what are you up to right now or something like that and then push those people into a chat it may not be sms based like dotty was it may be web based but from a, a message over WhatsApp or SMS. So there's lots of different use cases going on that, that fit in with different types of people um, and different types of candidates. Um, so that's what's happening in the real world. Um, I'm really excited to see what the future holds for this though, because I think um, based on the conversation today, there's so much more that can be done. Yeah, we talked, you touched this and, and so I just want to throw it and everybody would can, add, can answer, how can we ensure that candidates are not being disadvantaged or discriminated by the bots? For example, people with dyslexia. That's a great, that's a great question. Uh, well, first of all, I think the, uh, you know, Mark, do you want to, do, do you have an answer for this? Because I, I can, 
I can yeah. go later. <laughs> well, no, I was going to say it's actually quite quite great. Yeah, there's a huge thing right now about unconscious bias in recruitment, um, and you know, being able to initially screen somebody in the application process via chat rather than via a resume, via a picture, via a video, um, takes away a lot of unconscious bias. Um, now, you talk about dyslexia, um, unfortunately, um, it depends on the type of dyslexia, but there's obviously going to be some challenges there. But um, if you've got a good uh, NLP piece, then, um, then that should solve, uh, help solve it anyway. Jason? Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think that uh, there's bias when a human interviews another human. I don't think that there's inherently bias in this thing. Actually, having a machine do it, I think, would probably be less biased. Uh, but I guess if the machine is designed by a human, then it is biased. So it's just, it's inception. It just keeps on going down. You, you never get to the bottom of it. So um, <laughs> I also see that we're at the top of the hour here. And I yeah, know so. that people have a lot of stuff. And we haven't asked the, the beautiful, lovely people in the audience if they have any questions. And I think that uh, some of these people might want to ask questions. And if not, we might need to wrap it up just because we we're sort of already past the hour. Uh, mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, does anybody in the in the group have any questions, or anybody want to uh, you know raise their hand and ask something? Anybody want to add anything? Uh, I feel like I'm back in high school again. Jesus. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think that we're like making it close to the end. So uh, if it's possible uh, for you, um, we'd like you to like help us. Uh, just fill a, lead, a very short survey on our Zoom platform, which will help us to improve and be in touch with you forward. It's about to appear on your screen now, so take like 20 seconds to fill it. Um, if it's and one more thing, Iran. We also have a very active. We have a very active Discord channel. I know Discord is like for gamers, but we we have a Discord channel uh, server where we basically talk about all these things and we have discussions about chatbots. And if you are kind of in the space and you don't know where to start, you just talk to us. We'll be happy to sort of give you guidance. Uh, and I know that Martin is there and Alice is there and uh, Ken is there. So we have uh, a lot of people that are here and Iran is there. So uh, reach, reach out to us. Maybe someone can put the Discord link in the, in the chat and then uh, uh, we can basically let them, if they want to continue the chat, they can do it afterwards. But I feel like, uh, uh, you know, we've hit the top of the hour and these are very busy people. HR people are very busy people. Yeah. Unlike us chatbot people, we have the world. <laughs> yeah, Han already did it. And um, so, so thanks uh, a lot for this. And yeah. uh, I think that's all from our HR AI panel. So I would like to thank our experts, Martin Redstone for people. But thank you very much. And he had to go. He had a meeting. He's, uh, he's a, okay. He's, so he's a big time. So, so thanks, Martin. Thanks a lot, Alice Parsons from Tech Hire. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Dante Coladonato from Clarient. Thank you, guys. It was great. Thank you, um, Scott Gilbert from Anderson Hauser. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, good good and, seeing you. And uh, thanks, uh, Jason and the non-existing Yaki uh, from uh, he's, Coco Hub. He's here. You just can't see yeah. him. He's oh, okay. has <laughs> <laughs> invisible he's when he wants. <laughs> yeah. Wait. So, I told you he was right here the whole time. So everyone, thank you so much for joining. I hope this was helpful. I hope this was informative. Iran, thank you for moderating and doing such a wonderful job. And I really, really look forward to continuing this discussion on Discord or uh, just on email or whatever or fax. Dante, they can fax us too. Questions. <laughs> or pigeon. Awesome. <laughs> and yeah, we, we will like have a follow-ups on this one. So just uh, keep uh, being with our platforms and we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. It was a pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>